Hi, my name's Reese. Welcome to Threes to Wound. Today, we're going to look at something pretty interesting. So, I had the idea, now that lockdown's finally over, yes. to basically have some friends over and play some more Kill Team games because I'm well and truly overdue for trying some new teams, versing some new teams, and seeing else, uh, what else is actually available out there. The catch being, Kill Team is a one-on-one -on -one game. Well, at the moment it is anyway. There's no real extra ground rules or rules to say uh, the way you can play 2v2 or 1v1v1 with, uh, you know, four-player games, basically. We decided to do a little bit of a homebrew test of this to see if we can make it work, see if we can make it happen. Uh, and I thought this would be a great way to see more than two teams in action at a time. We had two new players in the group as well. So there's two players that are having to sort of learn the game. And that's really exciting. Having new players coming in is great. Uh, they had played a little bit of the previous version of Kill Team and just sort of got their heads around that. A bit like me. And then now I've come in and I've had to learn a new rule system within a span of six lockdowns. So woo! So being locked down and not seeing your friends and not being able to play social games. Uh, anyway, the good news is we're back, we're hanging out, and uh, it was really exciting to be playing again. To do this, we sort of looked at the game board, and obviously the Kill Team board uh, is slightly different size to the previous edition, but I did have two of the previous edition Kill uh, Team boards that I sort of set up uh, laid next to each other, and I thought that would be a good place to start for the battlefield itself. As I talk, guys, I'll pop up some photos. These will hopefully help fill in the gaps of what I've explained poorly and give you a bit of an idea of how we sort of set it up. Hopefully show you a little bit of the game as well because uh, it was an interesting game. Uh, a lot happened. I didn't go that well. Spoiler alert. <laughs> it was still really, really fun though and I'm glad that we got to give it a go. One thing we found upon putting the two boards together and playing the game once we got in the gameplay, having that more rectangular shape versus a more of a square, we did find that the battle still kind of broke down into two contests of 1v1 just happening to be on those on each side of the table. We did, uh, I guess, triangle deployment in each of the corners, just trying to make sure that the setups were fair. Each setup zone had an objective sitting just out the front of it. That was worth one victory point at the end of every turning point if you controlled it. Your opponent's uh, control point sitting out the front of their deployment zones were worth two if you could control those. And there was one objective worth a big three in the middle. Uh, and that became very interesting that one because it was wanted but it was also a bit of a bridge too far <laughs> in a lot of the movement sense as well. The train we used was a combination of the Octarius train but also just a bit of Mechanica stuff that I had lying around from the previous edition uh, which actually worked really well. It was a good mix. We didn't overdo it with vantage points. Uh, I'm looking forward to the new expansion uh, Chalnath. Chalnath, I believe that's how you say it. I've got that on pre-order and I'm really excited to see how that comes in adding things like punishing vantage points and obviously making making some more of that older terrain with multiple levels, higher levels, uh, making that a bit more of a valid option to use in Kill Team without having to make custom rules for it. Looking ahead to what happened with the game again, not spoiling what happened with the results, but a tip if you are planning to do something like what we did, uh, I definitely recommend splitting Using only half of that second board, um, there'll be a picture to demonstrate exactly what I mean. What we did find is that extra, uh, you know, probably six to eight inches of terrain just pushed the teams that little bit uh, too far away. It meant the two teams were in close proximity, which was good. They could fight. Uh, close combat was a viable option. But then the other teams, you were disconnected from those other ones on the other side of the board. It was really two turns of movement to get sort of get in effective firing range to be able to find good firing lanes and that. And then realistically to get into close combat, it was going to take you three to four turning points just to cover that distance in the board. So yeah, I definitely recommend just shrinking that board size a little bit. Apart from that, it worked really, really well. And luckily the games between uh, that were running on either side of the battlefield were still really, really interesting. If you've watched my other videos, you obviously know usually I play Gene Steel Colts as my team, but I'm really enthusiastic to try a new team. Uh, and I was sort of flipping through the books and I was like, I've got lots of models. I've got too many models. Let's be honest. I've got lots of options with my kill team, but one I've really wanted to try was more of a vanilla choice or a blueberry uh, depending uh, on how you look at the flavors. I'd recently finished painting up uh, a whole bunch of the series one of the Space Marine heroes. Uh, I'd had a lot of those blind boxes lying around and lo and behold I actually had um, six of them uh, and it made a kill team. So I was like well that's actually really cool. I'd never really painted Ultramarines. I think the first Ultramarines I ever painted were when I first got back into the hobby. It was a squad of five, um, five Primaris 
Princess uh, in Intercessors, painted them up using, you know, the, one of the starter kits. And that was really cool, but I hadn't really gone back to them. And this was an opportunity to give them another go and see if I could turn them into something usable. The idea being uh, here too, is I'd looked at some of the other kill teams, things like Intercessors, Infiltrators, Reavers. I had all those options uh, and I really like the, the Primaris models, but that something was really alluring about using the Firstborn Marines. And I thought that was going to be a lot of fun. The added bonus being they get a special weapon and a heavy weapon. So being able to take a plasma gun and a missile launcher was too good to pass up little bit less health, but getting those special and heavy weapons, I thought was going to be better than having sort of five bolt guns. It also meant that more models to hold objectives, you know, having that one extra, you get six Marines in the squad versus five in most of the others. I just thought tactically that sounded uh, sane or the better option. I have heard a lot of people being quite negative on things like the intercessors. Boom! Just Space Marines in general, um, that they're not too fluffy or they're not too much fun. I definitely say the position they're in right now with the Compendium, they are a bit vanilla because you are looking at every one of them is being five of the same type of unit. That's why I thought Firstborn was going to be a little bit more fun, at least having some variation with the weapon loadouts. We know in the future, good things are coming. I'm sure we'll get some really characterful, you know, we'll get chapter traits and we'll get things that are really going to make the Space Marines feel great. They are the darlings of Games Workshop, so I'm sure they'll get lots of great rules. So I wouldn't be too worried if they're your team. Uh, if we have a quick look uh, at my team, uh, I'll run it really, really quickly. Uh, so this isn't a battle report, but just to give you a bit of a feel for what I was running. You can probably see the character cards uh, that I'll be using here throughout the video. If you like them, um, I'll put the link of where I found them. Uh, these guys are really, really cool. If you use Battlescribe, it works really well. This was a great way to a good educational tool to help teach people, make it easier to keep all their bits and pieces in one place, uh, be able to follow along with their team, keep a track of their rules. I should have got better at it. The other thing I really recommend too, it sounds lame. It's lasers. Okay, it's lasers. I got this laser from the Army Painter. I got it just through the local hobby shop uh, and it's been awesome. And again, it was really helpful for new players and myself too, uh, just to work out your uh, firing lines, to work out your line of sight. It does look a little bit wanky, I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> having your little laser out. It does help to show and educate. It really makes, instead of uh, asking someone to imagine things about firing lines, or lines of sight that can be hard to visualize if you don't quite know what's going on. It made it very easy to settle disputes or to show why something works that way. So there's some tools I definitely recommend uh, for yourself as a new gamer to make your life easier. Even if you're a veteran gamer, just have everything in one spot at the touch of your hands. Sometimes I use my iPad with Battlescribe in that, uh, but I actually really like the paper method, being able to put your models with the cards as well. I found that really, really handy. So just some tips if you're wanting to do that as well. Uh, obviously had my sergeant there. He was carrying a plasma pistol uh, and a power weapon. Uh, the other thing too, I gave him purity seals. Uh, purity seals, if you don't know, gives you uh, a command reroll uh, for one of their actions, shooting attack, all that stuff once per game without having to spend the CP. Really handy if you remember it. I didn't. Uh, I got, had a bit of a mental overload of helping two new people learn the game and using a new team. I forgot a lot of things. I was forgetting to use strategies. I was forgetting to use uh, my command points correctly. I, I wasted a lot of them. My management of my team was, was poor. <laughs> Next up, we had the missile launcher. Uh, obviously, I like these. I think they're a really, really uh, versatile choice. Uh, the only probably negative, I probably would have chosen a heavy bolter uh, if I had it available. I like the idea of uh, heavy bolters. Being able to take advantage of bolter discipline, I think that's a really, really strong strategy. And that's realistically where most of my command points got spent during the game. I had a lot of bolt weapons uh, and I was hoping that that added firepower was going to make my Marines even more dangerous and kind of give them, I guess, a force multiplier effect with that ability to shoot twice. On the missile launcher, I also put the suspensor system uh, just to help make, basically keep that mobility and make it that he's not, uh, I guess, a sniper kind of character. Uh, I think that still means you can move up to three circle uh, and fire it without penalty. So that's still really, really handy for those heavy weapons uh, and makes sense with Space Marines too, being able to lug those things around and still keep them firing. Next up was the plasma gun, uh, and I think this has been a staple for uh, the last version of the game and this one as well. Plasma's great. Uh, I think if you can have fit it into your team in any way, shape, or form, I found this out later. Other teams can use mm -hmm. plasma, and it could really, really hurt as well. It's a great option to take. If you can fit one in, I definitely recommend it.
Another one I'm curious about, and I am doing some little uh, modeling projects on the side. I am still curious, though, to see things like the Melter Gun, the Grav Gun. Uh, I still think there could be some fun to be had with those. I do want to test them out. Uh, if you have yourself, you've got any thoughts on other ones apart from Plasma to take it and what makes them great, let me know below in the comments. I also chucked on uh, Purity Seals with the Plasma again, uh, hoping to get me out of trouble with any maybe hot rolls or if uh, I wasn't hitting very well. Again, I forgot all about that. The last three spots, splots, what's a splot? The last three spots was all filled out with uh, just uh, Bolter Marines. Uh, these guys are great. They're the, you know, the core of the, of the team with Bolter Discipline, multiplies their abilities a bit. I didn't have any equipment on them. In my mind going into the game, I was quietly confident. Power armor, heavy weapon, special weapon, uh, a sergeant for the unit that was going to be really, really good in close combat. Little did I know he'd never make it there. It seemed a very balanced team. Let's have a quick look at the opponents I faced, uh, and this will give you a little bit of context of how and why the game went the way it did. First up was Dan, my good friend. He's been my regular opponent throughout uh, the lockdown period playing with his Death Guard, so I'm pretty comfortable playing against them. I know a lot of their strengths and weaknesses. He was umming and ahhing whether to bring in a Plague Zombie fire team this time. Decided to go all Marines uh, due to the opponents he was facing. He thought that was going to be a little more balanced. For the first time in a long time, he actually brought a Plasma Gun as well. I think he got jealous uh, of mine. He had to borrow that one out of my cupboard though, so there was uh, obviously a two command point tax on that. So only fair. As well as that, he had his leader. Uh, the leaders for Death Guard, if you don't know, are brutal because they sort of go back to being uh, a regular sort of Primaris or Firstborn Marine upskilled. You know, they get a better weapon skill, they get an extra circle of movement. So when you're Death Guard, that's huge. Usually you're restricted to two circles. This puts you back up to three. So they're a lot more mobile than the rest of their friends. They're great in close combat. They're great at shooting. Things like malicious volleys, uh, malefic rounds, all those things on that character can make them really, really dangerous. It's definitely a model I've learned to fear over a lot of the games. And obviously they still get disgustingly resilient. The whole team gets that. Nothing breaks your heart more in a game than getting through a huge, big, a lot of damage, seeing the disgustingly resilient roll come up and seeing lots of fives and sixes and knowing that 10 damage or 11 damage goes down to four or five. Um, Death Guard really hang around. He then had a Plague Marine Fighter with the Flail. These are a great choice, probably more leaning towards uh, fighting Horde or I guess Guard equivalent armies. They've got Reap, so that ability to hit lots of uh, enemies and opponents around them in close combat is great. Another great choice here could have been the Plague Cleaver, uh, something to crack through a bit of power armor, especially getting versing my guys. The other two teams, Necrons and Admech as well, uh, both have a bit of armor as well, so could be a good option to be used against them. Uh, Needless to say, he still did pretty well. We then had a Plague Marine with the Banner, or Eric Banner, as we call him. Australians, oh, let us rejoice. Aussie icon. And the last guy was a Bolter Marine. So, a really strong team. Uh, Death Guard is good. Death Guard are a great team if you're new to the game, if you're starting out, because they're so resilient. It doesn't mean you can be wasteful or silly with them. There is still strategies to be played with them, but making a mistake with Death Guard, a lot of the time, you have a much better chance of it not punishing you as much. Yes, they're slow, but the amount of firepower they can deal out, the amount of damage they can take, and when they get an objective, it's very hard to get them off them. So if you are thinking of starting a new team, uh, Death Guard is definitely a really good place to start. We no longer say yes. Instead, we say affirmative. Yes, affir uh, affirmative. Next up was the Admech. Uh, and this is a friend of mine, Tim, who's pretty new to the game. He's played a few games in the previous edition. Uh, and he, we've gone the Admech for him. It was also a really good opportunity to try out Choo, the guys in this. I'll do a little bit more of a deep a breakdown of the Hunter Clade uh, in another video because uh, it was really cool to see them in action. I'll just touch on a few points here right now, but really worth it. If you play Admech, uh, would recommend. The Hunter Clade's a great example of what we're seeing with Games Workshop and the, I guess their plan for the new kill team, releasing t uh, teams to take over from the Compendium that are a lot more fluffier, but also give you more variety. Uh, basically, the breakdown of this is you get 10 total operatives, including your leader, and that's a bit of a mixture of Vanguard, Rangers, and Sakarans, so Infiltrators, Rust Stalkers. Uh, the benefit being here, it's not as restrictive as what you find in the other one, where you're having to take X amount of that one type of unit with a gunner option, 
X amount of Sakarans, and that's it. Here you can choose to have one, two, three. You can sort of mold that force a little bit more towards your playstyle. And if you built your list the proper way, having 20 operatives, you have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. You have a lot of options in how you can construct that team. So to start off his team, we had the Sakaran Infiltrator Princep. So that was his leader. And we added a little bit of extra gear. Uh, we had the Servo Skull. We had the Refractor Field, which is obviously a benefit uh, that I think just the leaders can take. So an extra chance to keep them alive, that better chance to get him up the board into close combat. We had two Sakaran infiltrated trackers. Uh, so these are, I guess, you're just your basic Sakarans. All the Sakaran units, we had the Taser Goad and the Flechette Blaster, which I have to say, I was actually really impressed with. I didn't get to see much of the Taser Goad. As I mentioned, the close combat was a bit hard, but he did manage to sneak them up, get them within uh, red, and instead of charging because it made more sense for some objective holding, using the Flechette Blasters to finish some units off or weaken some units uh, actually worked really, really well. I was quite impressed by those. They've obviously got the restricted range. Uh, they are uh, range that way that way pentagon there pentagon but they do have fusillade and relentless uh and they're pumping out five shots so five shots yes the damage is small but the sheer rate of fire on them makes them very very dangerous benefit of the taser goad over the power weapon just basically being a little bit weaker on the taser goad but you do get stun so very handy against things like marines i'm starting to respect stun a little bit more slowly i still haven't seen it used to huge effect as yet um but that's definitely something i think is interesting the rest of the team was obviously made up of rangers and Vanguard, a bit of a mix. We had two uh, gunners from the Vanguard, one with the plasma culver, 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 culver. Uh, one with the plasma culver, one with the arc rifle, uh, and then we had a ranger who had the huge unwieldy big sniper rifle thing uh, i believe from the early warfare from warfare from the early 1800s i believe uh the trans arquebus trans uranic arquebus sure little uh caveat with the way the heavy weapons work usually you can only take two uh gunners per squad but if you take three or less of the sakarans you can take the third heavy weapon you can also only take each of those heavy weapon choices once so that's why you see quite a diverse spread of those different heavy weapons. It was a great chance to see all of them in action. Though. We also got to see the Surveyor and the Dictat in action as well. So we took one of those because I was curious to see how things like the Omni Specs, Data Tether, how they performed in the battle as well. We probably didn't get a great example of how effective they can be due to a combination of learning the rules, new game, uh, new game. So Lil didn't probably didn't show off to the maximum. I'm keen to see them in another couple of games. They're definitely strong boosting units. That's what they are. They're you know, a ranger or a vanguard unit with the ability to buff their teammates and make them better. So, I mean, you could take one of each. I think you should. There's really no negative to taking them. And then the rest was just filled out with uh, a vanguard shock trooper and a ranger marksman. This being the first time I got to see them in action, I thought it was really, really cool. They are surprisingly resilient. They have a four plus armor save. And one tactic I learned to hate in this game, absolutely hated, the strategic ploy calculated approach. So you can see there until the end of the turning point, once activated, it's one CP. Each time an enemy operative shoots you from plus uh, Pentagon away, if they get a critical save, they then get to turn a fail into a regular save. That doesn't sound that powerful, but when you are being shot at by four attacks per, you know, per operative shooting at you, uh, if you get a critical and then you turn another one and being a four plus, you're 50, 50, all of a sudden you're looking pretty consistently of saving three, including a critical save in that as well. Uh, it really mitigates a lot of damage. That was, uh, unheard of. I think Tim rolled unbelievably as well. I think in the first three turns, I think he took absolutely next to no damage. A few operatives uh, with some heavy weapons maybe copped it a bit harder. But overall, the sheer survivability ad mech actually really, really surprised me. Again, this might be a consistent thing across all games, but in my one game of experience then, I was really surprised. I sort of thought they were going to feel a lot more like my Gene Stealer Cult, that glass cannon approach. Uh, but then when you add in their imperatives as well uh, and the ability to increase their defense or their ability to shoot uh, and plus the fact that all the weapons they have are actually really, really powerful. They're not really a glass cannon army. They hit really hard and their survivability is not terrible. I was really surprised by this. As I said, I will do a breakdown a little bit further into that team, um, but really impressed with what I saw with them last night. <laughs> 
the last team we had was Luke, and he had the Necrons, uh, the Tomb King Dynasties. Tomb mm. Kings? The Tomb World Dynasties. Uh, it was cool, again, to see another team. I'd heard really good things. I'd seen a few battle reports here and there saying that the Necrons were quite good. Uh, again, sheer survivability being their strength. Uh, and they lived up to it. Uh, we had two different fire teams here. We had one of warriors and one of flayed ones. So five of each. Uh, apologies to Luke. That was all I had in the Necrons. I know definitely should have been running Immortals, Death Marks, something like that. The warriors though, I must admit, did really well. They managed to be really dangerous the whole game. The way we set those up is we had three of the warriors with the Gauze Flayers and two with the Reapers. So a bit of a mix of getting some up the board for that mid-range support and three with the long range. Also gave the Starfire cores to the long range guys, just to add a little bit more punch to their shooting ability. The Flayed Ones, well, they were Flayed Ones. They didn't have too many extra special abilities. They do have access to the Skulking Killer uh, tactical ploy, which I think is really, really good. Um, really encourages you to keep them in Sneaky Boy mode till you get them up the board. Then charging from out of Conceal mode is really, really strong. It was great to see uh, the flayed ones get a chance in close combat. They're really, really brutal. They hit a lot. They don't hit super hard, but they hit really consistently and in high numbers. Uh, against Death Guard, it was interesting to see that was the clash that happened a lot. They got their biggest chance in combat against them, and they actually did really, really well. Plinking and uh, scratching and scraping the, the, the pus off the armor really, really started to add up. Unfortunately, a lot of them didn't get there till late game, so their impact really wasn't felt. That was more a product of the board setup versus versus them not being able to do it. I think if we had had that set up a little bit better, they would have been a lot more dangerous. The big thing we'll talk about here though is their durability. Living Metal and Reanimation Protocols are both great. It's really cool to see obviously the Necrons, it's very thematic, healing the whole time. You kill them, but they're not necessarily gone. Looking at their strategic ploys, looking at their tactical ploys, I found that that was one of your best uses of the command point, was just bringing them back, because it meant if you got an operative in a dangerous position, they got dropped, but then you bring them back in the next turn, behind the enemy line, still in that dangerous position, with some healing, some wounds from uh, Living Metal as well. They get D3 wounds when they come back, but then they also heal again. So I think they get another two wounds. So potentially they can come back with up to five wounds back, or worst case, three. So, I mean, it's not a bad way, and it just isn't something else that your opponent has to take into account. That operative might come back. They might not. The chances are high, but if they prepare for them to come back and they don't, maybe they've positioned a unit, you know, poorly. And, and we did see that late in the game. One of the warriors with the Gauze Reaper had managed to push right up, got aggressive, died. The Death Guard kind of moved on and all of a sudden they had uh, an operative behind their lines causing trouble. Uh, so it was really interesting to see the, the possibilities of what you can do. Maybe is there a bit of a way to plan to use that? Get your operative down there, let them get killed. And then when they sort of forget about them, bring them back to life and, and run around. So I was impressed. I feel... Uh, that, that again, this was a team being operated by someone who is quite new to the game uh, and obviously with probably not the best loadout at all for the Necrons in terms of the the warrior, the fire teams chosen. They still held up really, really well and uh, especially against a tough team like the Death Guard who they spent most of their time fighting with, I feel like they really held their own. I'll do some little bit more in-depth breakdowns similar to what I would do with the Gene Stealer Colts once I've had a few more games with each of these teams. So please uh, stay tuned for that uh, and in the meantime, if there's any other teams as well, you'd like to hear a little bit more more about uh yeah let us know down below now the game itself uh was really really interesting uh i said i'll just give you a bit of a i say brief recap but i keep saying that and then i get to edit this and i realize it's not so brief but i will do my best to keep it concise and keep it to the most interesting things one of the big things i thought my uh ultramarines were going to be one of the durable teams i was wrong by a long stretch with the Admech making the most of their imperative choices, uh, as well as also adding calculated approach, uh, they were hugely survivable. They can also use my motive force vitality, which can heal back uh, hit points as well. Uh, so a canny player with the Admech can really do a good job of keeping them alive and keeping them in the fight a lot longer. With this uh, deployment set up, my operatives were opposite the Admech, so I spent most of the time fighting with them. And despite a bit of initial success, I think I'd killed three of their operatives before they killed any of mine. After that, they wiped the rest of my team without me killing another model of theirs. Uh, and that's a 10 team model. So the Admech by the end of the game still had seven models on the board. I'd lost six Marines. I was hugely surprised by that. 
there was a few moments of slightly poor placement, forgetting things like my purity seals. There was definitely tactical errors, even not managing command points correctly. Things like only in death could have come in handy. Uh, put it down to lack of experience with this team and definitely learn some lessons to take forward into the next game. On top of that, as we discussed before, the Necrons, they don't want to die. They keep coming back. They've got living metal. They've got uh, reanimation protocols. They're going to not die or they're going to die, but they're going to come back. And that's exactly what happened. They did a great job of staying in the game just by being able to not die. Death Guard, well, Death Guard going to Death Guard, okay? That's what they did. Uh, disgustingly resilient. Dan was able to roll really, really well for most of the game with his disgustingly resilient. And that meant that it was a real Maya, a real slobber knocker fight on that side of the board between the Death Guard and the Necrons. Uh, it really divulged into, a, I guess, a very thematic kind of battle between two teams who both just wouldn't die. So that was really cool. My Ultramans, on the other hand, died a lot. One of the things that made this mission hard was the placement of the objectives that were sort of just out the front of each of our setup zones. That should have been an easy command point to get, but the only one that was actually had any cover or only way to hold it easily was the Admex setup. They actually were able to position an operative in behind cover, still within range to capture that objective. So that was a huge boost to them. Uh, and that's the benefit of winning uh, the choice of choosing where you want to deploy. It made the right choice there, uh, tip of the cap. The rest of us had to really battle to keep a model out there to score that point was really, really difficult. I found for myself, especially, there was a lot of vantage points overlooking my objective, uh, which made it very difficult. Once there was a couple of gunners up there, yeah, it was, it was the danger zone. I definitely found with the Marines, definitely jack of all trades, but master of none. Bolter discipline was huge, but the Admec for this game, I said this may be uh, a rarity, they were hugely durable. Uh, and so every time I thought I was going to drop one, I didn't. And they made some amazing saves. So it was a little bit of that day. It also meant that I had to play really defensive with my Marines, trying to scrounge and keep the cover. I never really got my guys up the board out of my uh, deployment zone. I started to maneuver towards the left because I knew I had some space on that side of the board. And I started to see that the only way I was going to win this game was to get that central objective. Not even win, maybe just draw, maybe just not be embarrassed. And that ended up being my plan. As I lost more and more models, I came up with a devious plan to make a hot skip and a jump straight down the guts to get that middle objective under fire uh and obviously when the both <laughs> when all three of my opponents realized what i was doing i thought they were all going to be caught up on the other side of the board fight, fighting each other um until a plasma gunner just strode forth and absolutely decimated my poor sergeant who had his transhuman physiology he was doing his best running across the board trying to be a hero <laughs> to get that objective for the next turn, for the last turning point of the game, uh, it was not to be. But then my brave sergeant also set up in a similar position, did the same thing. Uh, it was heroic. It was magical. He made it, um, but then he was brutally killed in the final turn uh, by the trans-Uranus arcubus Barnacle, the that big, heavy, awful sniper rifle. Too young. Absolutely too young. It was upsetting. It was really upsetting. Uh, what it was great to see, though, is the Admech from that point, too, with me losing operatives, losing my own objective, they were actually able to use the infiltrators to get up the board and then steal my objective. And at that point, I had one to two operatives and really couldn't shift them off it. On the other side of the board, it was... Uh, an absolute barn burner. It was a whole lot of fighting going on. In the end, weight of fire, uh, having that ability to use malicious volleys, shooting multiple times, and then of course, overwatch as well. Uh, some canny set up by the Death Guard as well meant they were using, taking good advantage of cover, holding their own objective, and then were able to sort of slowly, implacably march the way down the board to put pressure back on the objective of the Necrons. What was interesting, once they did get one there, the Death Guard and the Necron Flayers started to tee off on each other. And that was really where the Necrons swung it back the other way. But lo and behold, every time they got out of close combat again, there was a lot of bolters pointing at them. So it was a, a bit of a, a 
good two-way tussle for most of the game. It wasn't really until that last turning point that it's, you know, the Necrons had finally run out of command points uh, and being able to bring guys back. And I think looking back, I think the Necrons might have been a bit more aggressive early to put that pressure on the Death Guard. It definitely suited the Death Guard um, early, them sitting back a little bit further back. The big thing was because of that distance between the two uh, games, basically what it meant was that once the Admech had secured their side of the board and finished off uh, the Ultramarines, Hello darkness, my old friend. Uh, they were able to score a lot of victory points. And because the Death Guard and the Necrons had done so much damage to each other, they weren't really able to impact it until the last turning point. Finally, there was a bit of fire going back and forth across the board. Too little, too late. Admech finished up on eight, I believe Death Guard on three, and the Necrons finished on two. Uh, for myself, zero. But I took the moral high ground. I'd stayed up the night before to finish painting those ultramarines. So they were 100% ready to go. So I say I got those two <laughs> victory points for painting my models. Uh, and that's something. You've got to take the little victories. Everyone else had at least one or two models not painted. Some of that was my fault because they were still my models. But you get what you're given. So there's a little bit of insight. It was a really, really cool game. Uh, and it shows that the four player method can work. It's definitely very viable. Just keep those little things in mind that we had. And that was hugely on just keeping that board a little bit smaller. So don't go two full boards. I definitely recommend keeping that a little bit tighter. Tack Ops was something we decided to skip for this one. Uh, having those two new players in it, it didn't make sense to overload them as well. Uh, and for myself as well, already managing a new team, helping to, to work with the other guys as well to have a good clean game. Uh, I was struggling to remember my own rules, let alone having Tack Ops on top. That could have made it a much more interesting game though, looking back, adding in those secondary objectives, adding in new and different ways to score points. Because it wasn't a hugely high scoring game, it really could have changed the dynamic and probably would have forced people to, to make some more bold decisions. So next game, we'll definitely have that back in. Uh, I've got another one lined up for next week. So it'll be another four player uh, punch on fest. So we're pretty excited about that. Obviously, we've also got Channel Nath coming up. There's a lot of cool stuff coming up. I'm going to do a little bit more of a deep dive into the two teams that have come up in the White Dwarf as well. Now I've sort of had a chance to look over and review. I know I'm a little bit late. They literally took about 30 days to get here. It's been crazy in Melbourne, okay? It's been crazy. Not Games Workshop's fault, Post Office's fault. But I've got them now. I've had a great read, so I'll bring you some videos on those as well. Really excited where the direction of Kill Team is going and what's coming next. I hope you guys are really, really enjoying the game as well. I hope you enjoyed this video. It was a bit of everything. It was a bit of uh, a look at what's going on with those teams. A little bit of an example of how to play uh, four player. I'd love to hear what you guys have used, what custom rules you've uh, used to make four player possible as well. Uh, any more tips or advice would be great. I love hearing from you guys. I really appreciated all the support. Uh, if you do have the time, please uh, subscribe. It'll be there somewhere. Make sure you like and comment as well. I love hearing your comments. Um, I'll always do my best to write back and, and I love hearing what you guys are enjoying, not enjoying uh, and what you're excited about with the hobby. Uh, thanks for all the support. Again, guys, my name is Reese. This has been Threes to Wound. We'll see you next time.